Sonny Boy has a lot, and I mean a lot, going on in each episode. In a previous video, I went over 70 plus small details or visual storytelling examples from just the first four episodes, illustrating how dense of a series we have on our hands. It takes the old adage of show don't tell to heart, and then some. But what do all those little details add up to? I talked about what is being shown, but what is being told? Some concern the story, of course, the how and why of narrative progression. Many more hint at the ontological mystery, the speculative fiction elements that set it apart from our reality. Spread amongst those moments, though, we have both overt and subtle characterizations of our cast, and that is what I want to explore today. The sheer number of small details are easy to lose track of in the midst of everything else, and I thought it would be helpful to focus on one character at a time. There's so much, in fact, that I decided to split this into two videos, with most of the supporting cast in this one, and three of our main four in the next. Both videos will include the first six episodes of the show, that is, how we understand these characters through the series' first half. We aren't going to try to hit every character that has been given a name or a speaking line, just the ones where I think we can say something interesting, or there is some benefit from looking at the way they are portrayed. I personally suspect that all of these characters will find that going adrift challenges their idea of what they want or what they think of themselves, and we can already see some of this pattern in the first half. I also suspect that each person's power is somehow related to their characterization, so we will talk about those as well. Finally, I want to note that Sunny Boy does not employ some of the usual storytelling tactics to prompt an audience to root for or sympathize with its characters. There's no dramatic sob story, inspiring goal, or optimistic fresh start right out of the gate. Heck, the closest thing to a main character has apathy as his most visible trait, which is a rather risky move for capturing audience interest. There's a certain trust extended to the viewers here that we can sort out what makes these characters tick and why they are worth cheering, so long as we care enough to pay close attention. So let's try that, one at a time. Let's begin with our student council president, Tanaka Machi, aka Pony. My best guess for the origin of this nickname is her ponytail, as we will frequently see her fingering the end of it as an idle gesture. In fact, it's one of the very first impressions we are given of her. We find out that she is the student council president at the same time as learning that someone else has won an election to be the leader for their ad hoc society, our friend named Cap. He isn't really that sure about it and suggests she lead all the same, only to have Hoshi insist the results stand. As I showed in the last video, we get a very fleeting glimpse of her face falling at this exchange after she first smiled at the proposition. It's not until episode two that we get important context. Pony did not actually win the election for president. In fact, she was completely trounced by her opponent, but enlisted Hoshi's aid somehow to fake the results and claim victory anyway. She wants to be president, whether for the power or the status or to fulfill some expectation, and she's willing to cheat to get there. But she knows very well that her fellow students did not choose her to be their leader. The vote that Cap wins is just a fresh reminder. In reality, these kinds of votes are more popularity contests than a reflection of confidence in leadership, as Cap's example will end up demonstrating in episode one. We will get to see, though, the campaign posters from her presidential bid with her slogan of preserving our heritage. While I understand propriety and tradition are virtues in Japanese society, I can also understand how that isn't particularly exciting or inspiring to a bunch of middle schoolers. Running with that as a slogan characterizes Pony, as does the proper way she wears her uniform and her willingness to support the creation and enforcement of rules in the first episode. She is someone who benefited from the status quo and existing power structures in the real world. I think it's likely she comes from a respectable, high-profile family student council president may be something she either felt entitled to or was expected to successfully pursue. There's a little more evidence for this in the first exchange with Asakaze, when she decides to try ridiculing him in reaction to his protests against the rules. 
She casts his enthusiasm for his newfound power as something he loves because it's such a contrast to how powerless he was in their real world. Of course he's happy when he was just a stooge before. But she goes on to dismiss his power and what it means for him. It wouldn't work in the real world, and it has nothing to do with his worth. It's just something he happened to pick up. These comments imply that she was someone who did enjoy power or status before they went adrift. Indeed, even though Cap was voted to lead and she wasn't, she continues to take her own proximity to authority for granted, helping to argue for the rules and their enforcement. On the island, she seems to have ended up as the de facto leader anyway, for a time, taking charge of the crisis over the students who become frozen, being party to the ambiguous plan that Hoshi and Rajdani and Nozomi are part of, and trying to defuse the grumblings in episode five. Whether she is good at leading or not, she is comfortable in the role. We might thus assume that she is used to having her way or having others defer to her. This may be why she delights in opposing Asakaze's early rebellion, and why she has such bad blood with Mizuho for calling out her ill-gotten student president position. In fact, the way she reacts to Mizuho trying to expose her may further suggest that Pony comes from a family of influence or visibility. She demands that Mizuho retract what she said. Mizuho asks, why should she? It's the truth, after all. Yet Pony is incensed at her shrugging it off like this. She demands an apology, and it seems she does not get it, with some retaliation implied. Pony's problem here isn't that she cheated or got found out, but that someone was slandering her, causing her to lose face. For a certain, let's say, social pedigree, an attack on their reputation is untenable regardless of the complaint's legitimacy. Mizuho besmirching her good name is a worse crime than the stolen election from that perspective. If I'm right about this read, then her complaints early in episode four are especially tone deaf. She'll point out that the world really isn't fair. After all, there's someone on this island who doesn't need to compensate the others, and of course she means Mizuho. Amusing to have Rajdani reply with a straight face about there definitely being those in the world who are chosen to get special treatment. It sounds like I'm indicting Pony here, I realize, and some of this is conjecture. So let me expand on the idea of her comfort at being in the role of leadership. Cap fizzles out, and while there are people like Hoshi and Rajdani who could lead, they don't, directly at least, for various reasons. Others are perhaps less suited or even less interested. Into that space steps Pony, as we can see from the way she naturally takes lead in a few situations, calling the meeting for the crisis of the frozen students, pressuring Mizuho to be in charge of figuring it out and trying to produce results, calling for water when one of the homes is burning down. Heck, when Asakaze comes to complain about the rules in episode one, he himself acts like Pony is the one in charge, ignoring Cap until he butts in. She's also the one who challenges Ake-sensei when she first shows up amid a group of students largely taken aback by what she says and how she says it. She'll attempt to resolve the growing rancor against Nagara by bringing him in front of the others to force a dialogue. Even though the majority of the students will side against Pony in this matter, they allowed her to initiate and preside over it. Even in disagreement, there was willingness to let her lead or at least mediate. Now, you can argue that she doesn't actually have the necessary skill set for the task. But for example, in the case with the frozen students, she puts everything on Mizuho, and even though she will badger her for results, she doesn't have any suggestions of her own. She defers to Mizuho and Nagara for what they think is happening and how they think the issue can be resolved. She fails to keep the student body united in the face of Ake-sensei's appearance and influence, leaving it up to Nagara and then Hoshi to try to stop the schism. But she is not someone who wants the accolades or prestige of leadership without putting in the work. Maybe she isn't a natural, but she does try. We'll even see her trying to comfort her fellow students in stressful moments, such as the stuffed animal-making girl after the house burns down, and the girl with no sleeves after the student body fractures. She'll voice concern about Hoshi's reliance on the voice and point out that it isn't like him. And of course, when things go south in episode five and Nagara splits, she takes the portal skirt to Nozomi, judging it was the right tool and the right person to have it. That, at least, is a mark of good leadership, knowing when to defer and to whom. Maybe she'll get there one day. 
I do think holding something closer to real responsibility and leading without adult support will end up doing more for her than anything that could have happened while just being the student council president. Lastly, I want to talk about her power. I am operating under two assumptions when talking about superpowers in this video. One is that I think everyone will end up having a power, and the other is that the powers are not random, but are related to something about the person's desires, personalities, shortcomings, insecurities, some aspect of who they are that matches what the power can do. In Pony's case, her power is switch. She can cause objects or people to change places with one another in space, including herself. Well, I can see how that might be appropriate for her. Before they went adrift, she literally switched the outcome of the election, changing places with the actual winner. As I've discussed, she seems to want to be a leader and puts in the effort, but does not yet have the experience or know-how. There's a gap between the leader she wants to be and the leader she has been so far, and I'm sure she wishes she could change places between the ideal and the reality. Perhaps I'll even be wrong about her coming from privilege, and it's just that she wants so much to be part of that loftier few that she wants to change her place. We'll see. I think Pony's power is the simplest one to make a case for being related to her behaviors, and that's why I wanted to start there. Now let's talk about Tanigawa, aka Cap, who had a meteoric rise and fall in just the premiere. He goes from wielding the bat of authority to not even wielding any pants. In truth, Cap is really more of a follower than a leader in the first place. We meet him when he's worrying himself sick about the consequences of students breaking school property. He's part of the student council and fears he'll be blamed for not keeping order, a black mark on his permanent record. The actual responsibility of being in a leadership role isn't something he's accustomed to or comfortable with. He's kind of the opposite to Pony in that way. He'll let Hoshi reassure him that he has it under control, and will later let Hoshi dictate to him what he sends to the group chat. When he wins the election, he is even more nervous and, as discussed, tries to hand it off to Pony. She may have a level of comfort and leadership, but she doesn't have his popularity. When Hoshi insists, Cap lets himself be talked into being the leader just the same, that it has to be him. Thus reassured, he tries to act the part, but his unsuitability becomes plain whenever there is confrontation. Asakaze's protest against the rules and Nozomi's refusal of the phone are both instances where Cap is struck dumb by challenge. He needs Pony and Hoshi to step in to help him recover. They prop up his authority, letting him lead by following, basically. A cap perhaps strikes us as a bit of the dumb jock stereotype, but he doesn't have the cleverness for the job, and perhaps because of this, he doesn't have the confidence for it either. Why go along with it then? Well, Asakaze's accusation is probably near the mark. The cap has always wanted some kind of position. It's probably why he's on the student council in the first place. He wants to be important. But he's not really prepared for what that means, especially in such an unfamiliar circumstance. He's the proverbial dog who finally catches one of the cars he's chased and now doesn't know what to do with it. Cap is also passionate and impressionable, and so Hoshi's reinforcement of him as the leader, telling him his word is absolute, all the posters that are put up around the school, all of that pushes Cap further out on a ledge. He's increasingly trying to fill a role that is beyond him. It comes to a head with Asakaze's trio trying a little coup d'etat. The dynamic is still the same. You can see that Cap is flustered and helpless in his cage, while Pony and Hoshi remain relatively cool, yet it's still left to Cap to face the usurpers. All goes well as he hands out the first penalties, but then Asakaze is immune, having figured out the trick to it. This is the third direct challenge to Cap, but he still doesn't know how to handle it, and panics when the penalty doesn't work, striking Asakaze. Like I said, Cap is really a follower, he could lead so long as he had something to follow, whether the prompting of the other two or a clear script of handing out penalties. Left to his own, he's a loose cannon, or a loose bat. Well, he's in over his head anyway. Perhaps Hoshi thought Cap needed to think his word really was absolute so he'd feel confident in playing leader, and maybe needed everyone else to believe it to maintain order, but ultimately the Emperor has no clothes. And then Cap has no clothes, in a more literal sense. After this fall, 
Cap retracts from the story for a bit, save to remind us of his embarrassment. We have him be the only one who snaps to at Pony's order to go fetch water, but he returns haplessly bearing a bucket with a hole in the bottom, and after the fire was extinguished in the first place. It's pathetic. Then his fall is brought up in the confrontation with Mizuho, and he reflexively tries to, to cover up the memory of his shame at being stripped bare in front of everyone. For a moment, it seemed like Cap was only going to be an object lesson in letting power go to one's head. Instead, he takes center stage in episode 4 to share the tales of the Monkey Baseball League. His enthusiasm, and frankly, his storytelling chops, end up giving us a glimpse of why he would have been popular enough to win that earlier election. Cap as the spectator and supporter of something is the Cap who is passionate and affable and in his element. Yet in his admiration for the stars of the Monkey League, we perhaps can understand why he'd want to be someone with a position, why he'd want to reach for loftier heights. Perhaps it is natural to want to go from being the idolizer to the idolized. At the end of that episode, we get a scene which suggests that Cap has grown up a bit since the premiere. He admits to Nagara that he is thinking of quitting baseball, and his he knows better than anyone that he doesn't have the talent for the big leagues. This is probably literally true, but at the same time, it makes a nice analogy for his attempt at the big leagues of leading others. He goes on to compare his and his teammates' experiences with baseball, that in the beginning it was only for fun, just as it was for the monkeys. But then it became about who had talent, or how it would get them into college, and that took up all their time. Watching the monkeys reunited him with the initial passion he had for the sport, before it became about whether or not one was successful, forgetting about the destination, and once again, learning to enjoy the journey. It may be that in the month since his humiliation, Cap has decided to quit trying to be someone with a position, as Asakaze accused, to be happy just playing the sport or watching the sport, rather than wanting to be the star, and he certainly seems happier. He really is just a decent and simple guy who was put in a situation he couldn't handle. Going adrift started so sour for him, but now seems like an overall win, a clarifying perspective for his life moving forward and what he's actually suited for. Now, to only briefly touch on Cap's power, the description from Hayato's power list explains that Cap can somehow produce all kinds of materials, and for some reason, delicious curry is one of them, but Cap must be alone when he does so, and can only do so much in a day. Hayato seemingly didn't get much in the way of details from Cap. We also see Cap nervously changing the subject when it comes up in episode 4, so something about it is either embarrassing or needs to be kept secret. Considering he didn't think he had a power back in episode 1, he must have figured it out over time just like Nozomi did. Without knowing much more about it, it's hard to draw any parallels to his character. However, my own amusing headcanon right now is that Cap needs to be naked to use his power, and so he only discovered it after serving the penalty in episode 1. Thus, he's reluctant to talk about it, won't let anyone in the room when he uses it. Even if that's true, I still don't know what it says about him. But I don't think we're ready to quit learning about Cap and this particular power of his. Next, let's round out the student council members with Hoshi, who is largely responsible for what Cap went through in the series premiere. While Cap was popular and liked the idea of being important, he wasn't comfortable or experienced with leadership. Pony is comfortable with leading, and seems to be resilient under pressure, but she isn't popular, and she isn't skilled in the soft art of steering people. Hoshi basically fills in the missing gaps here, being very good at nudging others and playing the power game. He likewise has no problem with confrontation, but he doesn't seem to want to be the visible leader or the popular one. It's like he wants to be the man behind the man, perhaps explaining why he aided Pony in their original world and props up Cap in the new one. In a somewhat ironic twist, Hoshi appears to have his own man behind the man, or god behind the man, or principal, or, or voice. It's complicated. Here, I want to say that I originally wrote this script having only seen through episode 5, and I struggled to answer this question. How much of our understanding of Hoshi is his personality, and how much is the influence of the voice? It had been speaking to him since at least the first term of school, 
including the warning about going adrift. When that actually happens, you can understand how his faith in what the voice tells him could become strong indeed. To see how that complicates and attempts to characterize Hoshi, consider an example from the premiere. Hoshi knows how the rules of the shadow world actually work, but reserves that information for himself. So, we might conclude Hoshi is simply the kind of person that keeps his cards close to his chest. But what if the voice had advised this kind of misdirection, or even demanded it? Leaping to assume he's deceptive might then be a misunderstanding. He might actually just be cooperative. Luckily, the sixth episode came along and clarified things a bit for Hoshi, especially with regards to his normal behavior. Pony will ask him if he's sure this is the way to go, but more importantly, he says that doing exactly as he's told just isn't like him. So Hoshi is not the person who follows or who blindly trusts. What's more, the sixth episode begins with Hoshi having a conversation with the principal, the origin of the voice, and their talk is not one of him giving orders and Hoshi complying. Instead, the principal is asking why Hoshi came to the school on that day at all if he knew what was going to happen. Hoshi didn't use that foreknowledge to avoid the situation. Instead, he says that's why he came, that he couldn't just leave the others to it. But the principal questions the point of that logic. Did the other students ask him to save them? From that, I think we can infer that the principal didn't tell Hoshi to save anyone, or even to make sure that he went adrift with the rest. Hoshi may be getting information and instructions from the voice, but his motivation is his own. He wants to be the one who saves them and guides them. What's more, his comment about why he needed to come indicates his low opinion of the others, that he couldn't just leave them to it. That matches up with the very first impression we have of Hoshi in that bathroom conversation with Cap. Hoshi assuages Cap's fears by saying he'll come up with something. Sheep aren't that bright, after all. I have to show them the right way. I think then it's now okay to assume that a lot of Hoshi's behavior and words are his own, even if the plan he followed was not, and we can analyze his characterization normally. So then to kind of start again, he has a politician's instinct for how to move others as one of his more obvious qualities, and it seems he comes by it honestly. For my version of the subtitles at least, it appears one of Mizuho's posts is mistranslated, and the child of the Diet member is supposed to be a son, and in context, this must be Hoshi. Indeed, when Pony presents her proof that Mizuho is behind the forum slander, Mizuho's reaction is actually to look at Hoshi before making her comment about the privileged class. It's also his grandfather's lawyer he cites as the one able to produce the incriminating information, so we might infer that he comes from a family with a history in politics. As I also said, he seems to have no problem with confrontation, or at least he doesn't betray his feelings whenever they happen. We haven't had any examples of him expressing anger or stress. What we get instead often feels performative. He'll adopt a smiling expression in moments when he wants to appear friendly, or a troubled expression when he wants to appear concerned. It's as though he tries to use his emotional register as a tool to persuade, which of course strikes us as manipulative, or even sociopathic. This impression is accentuated for the audience by a visual technique with his eyes, where he will be drawn without visible catch lights. That is, he'll have no light reflections on the surface of his eyeballs. It's especially unnerving when he opens his eyes wide and has no catch lights, as that's the most likely time it would happen. It gives us a subconscious sense of the unnatural. In Hoshi's case, it only happens at specific moments, and I dare say they are mostly when he is doing some kind of manipulation or maneuvering. It's like we get to see past his mask, which emphasizes the existence of the mask in the first place. When he stares daggers at Nozomi and or Nagara at the end of the premiere, we're left feeling like Hoshi is antagonistic, perhaps even wicked, a knife in the dark waiting for the other characters. As it's gone along, however, we can tell it isn't so simple. When Nozomi calls him out for knowing ahead of time they would go adrift. Once accused, he becomes surprisingly forthright, even volunteering information about the voice he hears. Did he simply want the opportunity to reveal a secret? Is it further misdirection? Or is this just the best tactic to ingratiate himself with Nozomi? We don't have answers at the time, but it's hard not to think we may need to reassess why he behaves as he does. 
And thanks to episode six, we better understand Hoshi's goal. He knew about the flood coming for them on graduation day and had to prepare an ark for their survival. The exact details aren't laid out for us as to what specifically he was told to do, but there was one thing he pursued all along, keeping everyone united and under his influence. His tactics were multifaceted. The example with Cap we already mentioned, as Hoshi wanted him not only to be the leader, but to believe he was the one with the power. In reality, Hoshi was the one holding the leash throughout, and when Cap becomes unmanageable, he cut him loose. He also spearheads the effort to get Mizuho to apologize for the blue fires, which is just a step removed from accusing her of responsibility. It would be curious to know if he actually understood why the fires happened in the same way he knew how the penalties worked. After all, once it is understood, Mizuho's ability to endlessly produce things means that a lot of power will flow to her. You could kneecap that power if you turned everyone else against her first, preventing her from becoming a rival for control. Additionally, from that example, we should note how he channeled the uncertainty of the student body toward a specific goal. An exterior threat, real or not, is a useful tool for uniting the will of the people. Hoshi believes in the nobility of his cause, the certainty that he is their savior, and that makes him dangerous to individuals. The sacrificing Mizuho as a common enemy to bring the rest together could be justified in service to his goal. But, Mizuho does not persist as this boogeyman, and the virtual currency solves the problem with the fires. Nor is this the end of things which threaten the unity that Hoshi tries to cultivate. Episode 3 sees students one by one closing themselves off in the curtain world, exiting their society. Episode 4 brings us Ake-sensei, or whoever she is, who immediately stirs up grumbling after Nagara is unable to transport everyone home. Episode 5 then sees a much more obvious rift, as the grumbling escalates to accusations against Nagara, and many of the students are ready to pay heed to Ake-sensei's words. Now, Hoshi can't let that happen, but by then it seems his shtick has lost its charm. He has perhaps given too many speeches at that point, and his rhetoric is no longer persuasive enough to hold the majority together. It seems they've also seen his power enough times to consider it a transparent ploy, and can blow it off as well. I'm left wondering if Hoshi would have been better off not trying to steer others so aggressively out of the gate, because it leaves them tired of his routine at the point when it really counts. For a moment, it looks like his goal is out of reach. Between episodes 5 and 6, though, it seems Aki-sensei's own aggression caused a different rift, leading to Ace and Shanghai's little clique breaking away. They will eventually be shown taking a gem heart from the burning tree, a power holdover, and then delivering it to Hoshi to form the heart of his arc. This little narrative thread demonstrates the validity of what the voice tells Hoshi, as well as reaffirming his goal to bring everyone together. Pony had asked Hoshi about the missing central piece of the arc, whether they really didn't need to go looking for it, and Hoshi responds that supposedly it's going to come to them. That is precisely what happens when Ace contacts Cap, and why Hoshi responds as he does. Mizuho is all ready to cry foul at them slinking back because of how they treated Nagara, but Hoshi wants to let them come. As he'll say, if they were taking the step of contacting them, then they must be reconsidering their actions. And besides, if they're in trouble, we should extend our hand to them. That is what the arc is for. Hoshi isn't interested in holding a grudge or making them beg or submit. He wants them to reunite because he wants to save all of them. The ends justify the means for Hoshi. But just as his plans are coming together, something like doubt begins to creep in. Even though he will spend a lot of time in episode 6 arguing against the film project and insisting that the future can't be changed, we'll have a few montages of him reiterating the times that he's talked about saving everyone. At the end of one of them, though, we'll hear the voice asking if the others sought salvation from him and Hoshi will look rather downcast at this recollection. Even as the plan succeeds, he is increasingly unsure about his motive or purpose. Perhaps this explains his stubbornness throughout the episode, as he'll argue with Nozomi, Nagara, and Cap at various points about sticking to the path that he chose for them all. He's so sure that he's right, yet when they start the director's cut attempt, it becomes clear that he wasn't expecting it. Nagara and Nozomi start the projector, with the vision mosaic beginning and Asakaze's power retreating, 
and Hoshi will look up in surprise. The world really has changed. When Rajdani then suggests they give the project a try, he assents. While it does not work as they hoped, at the end, Hoshi has to admit that there was a chance they would become the originals, and further, that he underestimated Nagara. Hoshi was dead set on his plan throughout the series, and did whatever he thought was necessary to bring it to fruition, including surrendering his own decision-making to the voice. And while he does see it through to the end successfully, by then he realizes it was not the only possible way things could have turned out. I think it's fair to presume that he won't be blindly following what the voice tells him from now on. He's seen that it can provide a sure path, but that's not the same thing as the only path. With any luck, this gives Hoshi cause to reflect on whatever else he has considered the only way to do things, or to re-examine this savior complex he's been operating under all along. That could be a critical shift for our little society, because he does have the ability to influence and steer the others. On that note, let's talk about his power. As with ponies, it's easy to make a comparison to what we understand about his character. The ability to show vivid imagery to others is like a more tangible version of persuasive speech making. Forget conjuring up a scene with your words. Just skip straight to putting your audience into the scene itself. It's quite a complimentary tool for Hoshi. And curiously too, they don't seem to be outlandish fabrications. The first one he shows to Asakaze suggests everyone will be corpses in the school. At the time, the school was actually sinking into the nothingness surrounding them, so perhaps without the leap to the new world, it may have had some truth to it. Likewise with the imagery he shows of the entire island burned by the blue fire. That did happen after Mizuho made it rain, and yet it wasn't a permanent state for them because of traveling to a new version of that world. The most recent imagery was the students being led across a bridge with foundations of sand, which then collapsed, and this appears to be a metaphor for following Ake-sensei. We don't yet know the fallout from her interference or their quest to find new worlds, so can't really judge if it's as true a pattern as the warnings from the voice. It does unquestionably suit Hoshi, though. Next then, let's look at the guy who finds himself on the opposite side of the student schism, Asakaze. I think he is probably going to be one of the four main characters, along with Mizuho, Nozomi, and Nagara. But while I've separated those three into their own video to follow this one, at this point we don't know quite as much about Asakaze, so I am leaving him here. To start off, the previously mentioned scene where Pony mocks him is pretty telling. The very first line he has in the series is a complaint about the restriction on power, and he literally bangs his fist against the rules as he says it. As mentioned in a previous video, the way students wear their uniform tends to characterize them, and Asakaze's no-tie, shirt-open, bright red undershirt presentation just screams rebellious. Taking these together gives an initial impression of someone who simply doesn't like to be told what to do, someone who has a problem with authority. The pony's barbs are probably not untrue either. He was a stooge, she says, and he's so happy because he now has an ability that gives him a sense of power, of being on top, of being the authority rather than being subject to it. A guy with a grudge against the pre-existing social structure which kept him down, making him naturally defiant to any new structure that would restrain his newfound importance. His own words against Cap are probably a bit of projection as well. He is aware and critical of Cap's desire to be someone with a position, someone important, but perhaps he's so aware because they are not so different on that account. Once they are in the island world, and he has free reign to use his power, he largely does so to help Rajdani and company with the investigations and explorations. He's a key piece of their efforts, recognizably important to the work. Perhaps this explains why he is so cooperative when he seemed so contrarian before. However, we might infer that he pursues this importance from a place of inadequacy, that he wants to feel powerful and valuable because he did not feel that way previously. This is different from the way Pony seems to pursue a place of importance. She likely felt that way already, and so embraces the role, is comfortable with it. She does not try to sabotage Cap when he is the leader for a time, nor does she act threatened by the powers of others. Indeed, she kept her own power a secret compared to Asakaze, who flaunted his openly. Asakaze will feel threatened by the success of others, 
most obviously in how he reacts to Nagara's luck in finding the portals. We know now that it was nothing of the sort, but that is how Asakaze felt compelled to characterize it at the time, downplaying Nagara's aptitude for anything that he himself was attempting. This was true even during Nagara's time helping Mizuho with the investigation. Asakaze can't find any portals at all, despite days of trying, and rather than admit that Nagara might be better at it, or the only one who can do it, he makes a special trip to visit Nagara and imply that things are actually going great, that they are getting along fine without him. When he gets no rise out of Nagara, he further states that Nozomi was definitely fine without him around, perhaps in hopes of wounding Nagara or tearing at his confidence. It's possible that Nagara's success made Asakaze feel once again like he was a stooge, latched on to someone more important, and he rebelled against that feeling by striking out. Once they figure out that it's simply Nagara's power at work, that it isn't anything Asakaze even could do, his direct antagonization of Nagara seems to cease. That doesn't mean, though, that he suddenly feels secure. Though he continues helping with the exploration of the worlds in a way that only he can, he keeps himself removed from a lot of the other activities. He has maintained his grudge against Cap for months, which leads to him sitting out most of the baseball-related activities in Episode 4. I noted in the earlier video that the students at the end of Episode 4, awaiting transport to their new home, are all physically separated in another little bit of visual storytelling. While the bulk have packed their things and wait in one group, fully expecting to be going home, the more in-the-know group of Hoshi, Pony, Rajdani, Mizuho, Nozomi, they're all separated, and none of them have packed their bags. Well, Asakaze is also in this scene, but he is in a group of just himself. He likewise is absent during the meetings where Nagara and Ake-sensei are discussed, and the confrontations that it spawns. Instead, we twice find him hanging out near the otherworldly diving pool that it turns out he is responsible for, keeping only himself for company. It's Ake-sensei who approaches him, and if we hadn't been able to discern his insecurities before, their discussion makes them rather plain. He'll deflect her compliments about the diving spot, and whatever he did, by saying that it's no big deal. There are lots of talented people out there, and he'll clarify that he doesn't just mean in this current world, implying he is thinking about where they came from, the many talented people from their lives before, and he is effectively saying that he's not one of them. But Aki-sensei feeds him some things he wants to hear. You're not like the others. You're special. Nobody understands. Not, not even you. The hidden desire of many insecure people to have secretly been worthy all along, awaiting a day when someone recognizes their value. She sweetens the deal with physical affection, perhaps also something he craved but lacked. In fact, there are a few moments which may suggest Asakaze may have a little crush on Nozomi, one that goes unfulfilled. I already mentioned his bit with Nagara, where he adds that he spoke to Nozomi and she said she was fine without Nagara around, which we know isn't true. At the start of the next episode, with the diving hole, Mizuho will be trying to coax Nagara to dive in after Nozomi, implying that he is the one she is calling out to, and interested in. It's instead Asakaze that leaps in ahead of him, and Mizuho will comment that he beat Nagara to the punch, implying a rivalry between them concerning Nozomi. In the fifth episode, when our main four are trying to solve the mouse world, Nozomi will make a joke about Ake-sensei's boobs, which gets Nagara all flustered, delighting her, and Asakaze will walk into the frame during this little flirty exchange, and he will look at them and then look pointedly away. And finally, circling back to Ake-sensei and her physical affection, we have the most telling bit in the sixth episode. Ake-sensei will once again be filling his head with grandiose words of his importance as she continues prodding him to stop what Nagara will eventually try. Their powers are made for one another, she says, and Asakaze goes to embrace her and rest his head on her chest. Yet, while he does so, he has a momentary flashback to a conversation with Nozomi. She'll be asking if he's ever coming back, as she wants to get to them all together again, but his response is, you've got Nagara, right? She seems to miss the implication, and goes on to gush about Nagara is still plugging away, trying to prove to himself that he can stand up to the world, and her grinning throughout. Then we cut back to Asakaze, 
who narrows his eyes as though the memory of her talking about Nagara is unpleasant. That he is this close to Ake-sensei but thinking of someone else perhaps means that whatever appeal she is banking on will be short-lived. I also don't think it's too much of a stretch to think that Asakaze's insecurity prevents him from pursuing an interest in Nozomi in a more direct way, and it may influence both his desire for status and the way he has clashed with Nagara. I think there is still much to discover about Asakaze, and the conversation at the end of episode 6 with Ake-sensei, I believe implies that he will pull away from this savior role that she has tried to foist onto him. He has some doubts about what they did, and I don't think he was ever really comfortable with the position, as I think is plain in episode 5 when she points the crowd his way. He doesn't really want to abandon the little social circle they had developed, but incompatible goals created a rift. Now that so many plans have come to a head, perhaps he can try to mend things. Lastly, let's talk about his power, or as much as we can, with limited understanding. The power list that Hayato put together called it Super Gravity, but looking at the larger body of examples, it's clearly more complicated than that. He can distort the first world, he can conjure and dismiss rain on the island, and he can interfere with the defense mechanism of the two-dimensional mouse world. To say nothing about the diving spot, and whatever it is Ake-sensei means about how what he did made it so the island got away without sinking. It seems more like he can alter the worlds themselves. However, it seems he can't create them, the thing they now figure Nagara must be doing, even if it's explained as observation by the principal. This presumably also explains why Asakaze couldn't find the portals. Perhaps he also had his power before they went adrift? But without a created world to alter, he couldn't use it. Perhaps he needs Nagara to go first. There's a kaleidoscopic montage that may further imply this complementary relationship. Scenes of the worlds they've been in will be shown warping around a silhouette of Asakaze. Then it will cut to that same procession of images, but now contained within the silhouette of someone pictured from the collar up, and contextually it seems likely to be Nagara. Perhaps there is some truth to Nagara wanting to escape, and that's why his power works the way it does? If so, then Asakaze doesn't want to flee the world, he just wants to change it so it better suits him. Let's briefly look at Hayato, even though he's a bit more of a background player. On a surface read, he has been presented to us as a bit of a busybody and a bit of a chuni. He first shows up half checking on Nagara and half fussing at him for not being in compliance with the rules and duties in the first world. He will, in fact, mostly interact with Nagara, and from a few clues we can guess that Hayato might actually have been closest to Nagara before they went adrift. Not only being the one who checks on him, but working alongside him when they build houses, being near him when the money falls from the sky, and commenting on how it's nothing new that he's always spaced out when writing his power list. Knowing Nagara is not the same as respecting him, though. That much seems to be plain. Hayato seems to feel the opposite way about Asakaze. The entry he writes in his power list puts Asakaze well above everyone else, and he will cheer him when he believes that Asakaze fixed the island at the end of episode 2, and gush over how cool his power is when he flies off from interrupting the investigation. Hayato in that instance doesn't seem bothered at all by how Asakaze treated Nagara, he seems to be starstruck. I think this is just due to him being, again, a bit of a chuni, and thus getting carried away by the whole superpower thing. His power list isn't just a simple description, he assigns them ranks and power levels and types as though he was compiling a tier list of gaming characters. I think this tendency also explains the exaggeration in episode 2, when he claims that Nagara witnessed Mizuho causing a tree to burst into flame by giving it a hard stare. He's not being a malicious liar, really. He's just really caught up in the supernatural part of the story around him. Now, the reason I was interested in including him and emphasizing his relationship to Nagara and Asakaze is because of the developments in episode 5, where suspicions against Nagara rise and are fanned into flame by Aki-sensei, who simultaneously pivots to promoting Asakaze. Hayato is ostensibly in the group that has taken that side, and from what we'd seen of him to this point, that seems expected. However, there's several instances where we get to see that he's not so certain. He'll be troubled over the initial suggestion that Nagara is only pretending he can't go back home, 
When the later meeting results in the students splitting up, and the original accuser is death staring Nagara, you can actually see Hayato walking behind him and shooting a worried glance at Nagara. And when that same student affixes the savior moniker to Asakaze at the end of episode 5, Hayato looks at him with alarm. Additionally, when Hayato challenges and then pushes Nagara down, I think this is far less hostile than it might at first appear if you take those other details into consideration. Hayato accuses Nagara of always pretending to give up while actually hoping for something, which even further suggests that he has known Nagara for a while. This strikes me not as Hayato piling on to isolate Nagara, but rather as a kind of tough love. He's not trying to punish Nagara for what he said about not caring what happens to others, but to snap him out of his apathy and his reflexive helplessness. Hayato might not have thought a lot of Nagara in their original world, but perhaps he knew him well enough to know that the accusations against him didn't make sense. Just like what happened with Ace's group, after episode 5, Hayato seems to have second thoughts about the borderline lynch mob of Ake senseis but he doesn't appear to have joined any particular faction. We don't see him with the student council, or with Ake senseis group, or with Ace's group, or even in the classroom when many of the meetings are going on. The only moment he really features in the sixth episode is a brief scene where he is doing some late night texting. What he has typed out but has not sent is an apology, and I presume to Nagara. It's left ambiguous about whether he does so or not, but it affirms the hesitation and conflicting reactions he had in the previous episode. Hayato ends up in the role of someone who gets easily swept up, whether by the powers or the mobs, but he doesn't quite lose his sense of right and wrong. Now, perhaps we'll get to see him make amends with Nagara in some way. Now, I don't want to leave his power out, and it may be that it will also have more to it than we at first understand, but all it seems to do is let him light up the end of his finger. He even calls it terrestrial, seemingly a reference to E.T., the extraterrestrial, whose title character had a similar ability. That is technically a famous example of some supernatural power, and so maybe that is why it suits our Chuni Hayato. Maybe there's some commentary there about superpowers as not all they're cracked up to be. Last of all for this video, Rajdani. Rajdani is effectively the science guy for our cast, but there have been some painstaking efforts to keep him from falling into the usual stereotypes that follow that particular archetype. He is very socially competent, he's personable, he's likable, the natural leader. He shows interest in his fellow students, reassuring one at the end of episode one, sharing what he has learned with everyone at episode two, creating the currency app that solves the blue fire problem, warning Nagara about the changing sentiment among the student body, and so on. He also has a bit of whimsy about him, a playful creativity, and it's most obvious in the design of the things he creates with his power. The camera that looks like a Fabergé egg, the slinky dog hand things, the self-propelled cat toy, the little Mario Brothers-esque power-up cubes. It's safe to say that he's having fun with what his ability can do. He's also very enthusiastic about tackling the mysteries of their situation and seeking solutions and understanding. It's like all of the positive aspects of a mad scientist or a lifelong researcher without any of the stigma. He also comes off as trustworthy, perhaps another way he bucks the usual pattern. He doesn't seem interested in being the leader or holding any power, which probably helps the others trust the things he says. Mizuho, for example, was pretty isolated and misanthropic at the beginning, and yet she will open up to Rajdani about hearing a voice that blames her for setting them all adrift. That's quite the show of trust from someone who is slow to do so. Rajdani is also optimistic. It seems he named the place Hatino Island, which is an uninhabited paradise-like island west of Okinawa, a rather hopeful appellation. He likewise titles their project after the novel Robinson Crusoe, which is an overall optimistic look at humanity and society through the lens of a man trying to rebuild civilization on a deserted island. When Mizuho comments on the statue he carves and asks if he believes in God, he'll answer that it's not so much about God, but he does have faith. Not a very specific answer, but I think it implies a hopeful outlook and it bucks another science guy stereotype. That said, he does have some moments of reckless disregard. 
In order to demonstrate and test his theory about what is causing the blue fires, he'll have Nozomi accept one of his creations, a little Tanuki power-up, and will see him ready a bucket of water at the same time. She will catch fire, and he will extinguish it, soaking her through. There isn't much thought, and no apology, for making her think she was burning and then drenching her. He'll likewise take Hayato's glasses at the end of that episode to demonstrate the blue fire mechanic to the rest of the class. It's an effective illustration, but now Hayato doesn't have his glasses. There seems little thought given to the impact on his test subjects in these two cases. So while Rajdani is very curious and enthusiastic and interested in their situation, I'm left wondering how much of his behavior towards his peers is scientific curiosity as opposed to actual compassion. The only person he seems to specifically care about is Nagara. I already mentioned that he will warn Nagara about the changing sentiment among the students before that little confrontation takes place. We'll also see him leave his usual laboratory area to go searching for Nagara, along with Nozomi and Mizuho. He'll also try to deflect the original accusation that Nagara might be keeping them there on purpose, and will repeatedly emphasize to Nagara that he is special when the two of them are in the film world. Maybe this is still only due to Nagara's power fascinating him, but Rajdani doesn't seem to show this kind of interest in any other specific individual. Because of how Rajdani stays out of various power struggles, we don't get a lot of emotional range from him, or a chance to see how he handle more direct confrontation or stress. Now, the closest thing is when he tries to convince Ake-sensei that their project can't really end the world. It strikes me at times that he is more of an observer of the society than someone who thinks of himself as part of it. Last of all, then, his power. It complements him well, a superpower suited for an inventor. One thing I think worth pointing out is that the things he makes appear to be items which don't otherwise exist, even though some are simply tweaks to existing things. Some are just fun bits of his personality made manifest, like the power-up cubes or the recovery potion that he feeds to Nagara, but others are pragmatic, such as enabling various forms of machinery to function without external power sources, because they basically don't have those. In the same way that Nagara and Asakaze's powers seem like they might be different but complementary, Rajdani's power seems to complement Mizuho's, which we'll talk about in the next video. In brief, though, her power manifests things which actually already exist, while his creates things which do not. Now, I have no idea what will that mean uh, precisely, or if the distinction is even important. However, I do want to draw attention to a little exchange near the beginning of episode 4. Hoshi will be gushing about him, maybe buttering him up, and will proclaim that his talents can do anything, but Rajdani deflects, saying it just comes in handy is all. And then he says something curious. It's not the kind of power that changes the world. Maybe this is just him being humble, but perhaps it reflects how he sees his own relationship to their society. As I've pointed out, he doesn't seem interested in taking power or leading others or imposing his will. Is he thus saying that he personally isn't going to try to change the world? Or does he mean it more directly, that his scientific curiosity and inventiveness is not, by itself, the kind of thing that shapes their reality? Is this a clue to how this experience of going adrift will shape his own understanding of the world and his own place in it? I don't know yet, but after the second characterization video, we're going to take a look at the themes and some of the larger patterns in this work, probably up through episode 8 or 9, and I may have a better chance to ponder that then. This ends part 1 of the Castaway cast, looking at the first half characterization of the main players in Sunny Boy. Look for the second part in a matter of days, where we'll focus on Mizuho, Nagara, and Nozomi. We are also live streaming about this show twice on Thursdays over on Twitch, and I encourage you to join us if you are catching this video during the season. The first show includes a pre-episode discussion, a synchronized live viewing, and then a following analysis, and the second show later that night skips the live watch and is all discussion building on whatever we've managed to figure out in the few hours before. What you see on the screen are the times for the two streams. You can find us over at twitch.tv slash nearlyonred. I'll see you again soon when part two is released. Thank you for joining me today.